Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I'm Reuven Ben Shalom, sitting in for Jonathan Hessen. When Israelis ponder their security challenges, they're usually torn between the frequent phenomena of terror attacks by Palestinian perpetrators and the longer-range threats from Iran and its local proxies in Lebanon and Gaza. It is also obvious that these separate challenges can converge once a minor incident escalates into a major campaign on several fronts. If that is not enough to rattle nerves in the heat-struck Middle East, domestic cohesion has been ruptured by controversial legislation, and the protests have been led by former military officers, no longer obliged to serve in the active reserves, who have withdrawn their willingness to volunteer for service. This, in turn, emboldens Israel's enemies. Altogether, it makes for a complex strategic situation, and to analyze it, we are joined by Colonel in the Reserves, Dr. Reran Lerman, co-host TV Middle East Review, Powers and Play, and JISS Vice President, and editor of the Strategic Jerusalem Tribune, my friend, Dr. Uh, Brigadier General Reserves, no, is okay. Doron Gavish, <laughs> maybe someday, <laughs> former Chief of Air Defense in the Israeli Air Force, and our very own editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Please get us on the right track for this sensitive discussion. If Dr. Gavish tells you that he's also making house calls, <laughs> you should, you should yes. suspect uh, his motives. <laughs> now, what you just described <clears throat> is an amalgam of substance and symbolism. Because the various threats and challenges uh, are known, and you enumerated them. But the question is, how does an enemy of Israel, and there are many enemies, one longs for the time when there were only coherent, solid actors, states, or even organizations with a chain of command, with leaders, with protocols. Now, of course, uh, the terror attack can come from anywhere. Any, any Palestinian, any, any uh, Lebanese uh, who decides to cross the border, and uh, even with the best intelligence service in the area, you can't know and predict everything. But what happens when the domestic turmoil here is reflected in the minds of those around us. And you add to the basic assessment that they make regarding whether it's in their interest to act now, the sort of miscalculation which can arise when they believe they see a target of opportunity. So this is an added strata to what is usually facing Israeli policymakers and military officers. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Dr. Lehmann, maybe let's start with what's going on inside Israel. Maybe in a nutshell, try to describe to our viewers what's going on now, and then we'll take it to the level how it's perceived from the outside. Well, at, at the most formal level, uh, the debate is about uh, aspects of a reform program put forward by the new government, uh, right-wing uh, elected government coalition government, uh, almost immediately after it took office, uh, early January, it put forward the whole uh, package of changes to the balance of power between the uh, branches of government. The, the claim is that the Israeli Supreme Court, this is focused on the Supreme Court, um, and, the, uh, and the legal profession generally have taken over the, manner, the matter of governance have uh, hampered government initiatives, have made it more difficult for government ministers to make decisions. Um, perhaps also in the minds of many in, on the right, the Supreme Court uh, represents liberal values that they do not share. And, uh, and they wanted to change this balance through a whole package. Right now, it, as, as, as we are here, the focal point of uh, the debate is over whether or not the Supreme Court is allowed to rule out certain government decisions and appointments because they are not reasonable. And uh, the attempt is to change this by legislating that this will not, the Supreme Court will not be allowed to use the reasonable, uh, reasonableness clause, so to speak. But <clears throat> underneath it all is a much deeper crisis. Um, 
which is not necessarily about right and left in the traditional sense, but I would say it is uh, a growing tension between what I would call an insurgency within the Israeli right, not the entire hard right, uh, right, but the hard right, and which is the, the power, two of the participants in the coalition actually running as one list, but these are two right-wing parties that join together, and elements within Netanyahu's own party, the Likud, who basically question not only the, the legal system, but the entire quote-unquote deep state. They are not happy with the military either, and we've been hearing this in very blunt terms. They suspect the entire Israeli military establishment of being too attentive to world opinion, too attentive to liberal values, too attentive to uh, international humanitarian law in warfare. Uh, these are things that go back to the scars of the uh, disengagement from Gaza in 2005 and to the brutal argument that arose when an Israeli soldier shot dead a prostrate uh, Palestinian attacker who was already no longer a danger. Uh, and the, the fight over this one individual, uh, Eloah Azaria at, at the time, sort of brought into focus the differences between elements in the hard right that suspect the IDF to be blunt of being too soft, too centrist, too leftist. And this deep fissure has opened up a, a, an even larger question. A, a very large element of Israeli society does not serve the ultra-Orthodox, but they are partners in the government. Um, for years, there has been a kind of unwritten contract. Uh, you get your permit not to serve. You get budgets from the government. Don't interfere with the way we live. There's a sense that this social contract is broken, and this feeds the anger of the protest movement. Let, let me interject for a second uh, for the sake of our viewers um, who live in various systems of government. Israel does not have a constitution and it doesn't even have a, the tradition of nations without a constitution such as Great Britain. In other countries where you have a constitution or something uh, which is the equivalent, the uh, high court interprets the laws which is, of course, a lower form, lower than the Constitution, according to its interpretation of the Constitution, which, of course, is also open to change and to uh, political nominations. But nevertheless, there is a gold standard. In Israel, what has happened was that su the Supreme Court took upon itself to decide whether certain government decisions were arbitrary or perhaps even corrupt, and then override, overrule. What the government now wants to say, what to do is to do away with this ability of the court. It wants to reach its decisions as the ultimate word. Once the government decides, you can get no relief if you are a citizen uh, whose neighbor was given preferential treatment by government decree, this is it. Mm -hmm. By the way, for the sake of our viewers, uh, they should know that we struggle to understand what's going on. So <laughs> certainly from the outside, it's difficult. Yeah. But, but, but I think it was a really amazing way of uh, describing the situation in a few minutes. Maybe even correct. This, uh, Maybe it was correct. very interesting, and it <clears throat> demonstrates how this is not only about a specific reform, but we are a nation that's struggling to build itself only 75 years and still working on it. We're saying to, to Jewish 10 opinions. So, Absolutely. Uh, well. Don, take us to the place <clears throat> the military is... Uh, now serving in a way in this debate, maybe even blown out of proportion, and also the sensitive issue of reservists. Can you explain to us what's going on here? Yeah. Well, it, it is, a, I would say, a, a huge challenge and uh, that we are now uh, facing. And uh, from, from the reserve point of view, there are some of us, there are, from their point of view, we are in a position now that... The, their own identity as serving in a military of a democratic uh, country, it's been armed uh, in a way that uh, they cannot serve anymore in such a military 
that is uh, serving a government that from their point of view, uh, it's not as democratic as it was in the past and all the applications of what does it mean. So within the military and most of it within the reserves on the military led by the, the Air Force, we should say, reserve and, and the Air Force pilots, uh, the decision of uh, some of us is that uh, I'm, it's not that I'm not serving anymore, I'm holding my service in the IDF. And by the way, this is, this is uh, also something that needs to be, um, this terminology is also uh, important because some of uh, the people that are talking through this phenomena are saying that they, are, they don't want to serve anymore in the, in the reserve. It's not true. What they're saying is that we are holding because we feel something... There's no refusal, no disobedience. The government exactly. is calling it insubordination, exactly. which could sound illegal. In fact, it's people, after their term of uh, mandatory service, they can stop volunteering. And, and exactly. And those are people that are volunteering. By the way, we should say weekly. Once a week, they go uh, to, the, to the IDF to serve. Uh, so it, we, we, we shouldn't take it for, for granted. So, so this is really where, where we are in, in the military. Some of us are feeling that this balance of, and you know, it's, it really it's struggled be between values. The, the value of uh, serving in the military, being part of the IDF, doing whatever your, your government will tell you, this is what you're doing. And, and from the other side, there is the value of democracy and my identity as a civilian here in Israel, and this is really, the, we are facing now a struggle between values. Objection. No, this is your honor just to get your attention. Sure. Actually, I don't want to object, but if I may volunteer, if we're talking about volunteer, um, a sort of reserve 101, again, for the sake of our viewers. Each Israeli youth at 18 has to serve some three years. There are differences, but basically, Boys and girls. Now, as we said, the ultra-Orthodox are exempt, the Arabs are exempt, and there are um, hundreds of thousands of Israelis over the years who have served out their conscription. Some of them then go into the active reserve and uh, can be mobilized uh, when their commanders and the government needs them. Later on, as the age, some of those are being told that their services are no longer necessary. Some of those volunteer nevertheless in order to beef up what the regular military needs. It is those people who serve beyond their years and even beyond the commitment of those on the active reserve, sometimes a hundred days a year, sometimes without relief, one period after the other. These are the people, mostly, who say, I'm not going to do it as long as there is a risk of the democracy becoming a dictatorship. But although individually we're talking about people exercising their civilian right, collectively what we have is a, is a national impact on our national security, yep. which Definitely. is why, again, and what we see now is not only a real fight over values and, and law, but... Be because for budgetary reasons, it was quite comfortable for the government and for the military to depend on those people. They did not have uh, to recruit more people for career mm -hmm. positions or to keep more draftees mm -hmm. on active service. They knew that they will, can always count on those people to fill the, the ranks. I just want to point out that we are proving to ourselves how each issue can be painted in a different way. It depends what side of the aisle you're on. This issue could be, point, as I said, portrayed as insubordination or exercising my right. And also we see from the right now, from the government, almost calling it a military coup. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, it's a reserve. It's saying, no, I'm going home. This is no military coup. I never heard of a military coup. If someone says, I'm going home. I'm not gaining power. But uh, Dr. Lehman, I want to ask you, how do you think the region is perceiving what is happening now inside of Israel? Because we do want to take it to the real impact on our national security. Well, it of course depends who in the region. Uh, there are still some remnants of the democratic forces uh, that emerged in the region in 2011 that look with envy 
to a society where you still have free speech and the right to, to demonstrate and, and a powerful uh, movement. And uh, maybe are getting nostalgic about Tahrir Square. But um, others, um, of course, our partners uh, in the uh, Egypt, Jordan, and the uh, Abraham Accord countries are definitely uh, worried uh, about Israeli uh, political stability. Uh, but are still signaling uh, their interest in in going forward. The uh, the recent example is the Moroccan relationship. Israel did what the Moroccans expected, and the re response was an invitation for the prime minister to visit. So as far as they are concerned, ultimately there is one Israel, and and it is that Israel, uh, the Israeli government that they will work with. The question really arises as to Hezbollah, and uh, which uh, who happen to be very keen observers of Israeli affairs, and their Iranian backers. The Iranians are very keen to paint this um, as something uh, very dramatic happening in Israel because they were the subject of a powerful international campaign uh, supporting the protests in Iran. So now they want to, to show that it is Israel, not Iran, which is falling apart. Whether they are tempted by their own rhetoric to actually believe this is another matter. I Let's say carefully that I hope they're not. Uh, rhetoric is one thing, and any misapprehension about Israeli, actual Israeli capabilities should be dispelled by the fact that the IDF continues to carry out the campaign between the wars in Syria day in, day out, despite the domestic turmoil. It was an operation in Jenin to root out uh, terror elements in the Janine refugee camp, uh, quite effectively carried forward with broad support across the political spectrum. There are nightly operations against terror infrastructure in, uh, in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria. Uh, all of these are going on uh, as if this is not happening. So um, I would be very, if I was Hassan Nasrallah, I would, I think, compartmentalize uh, and, and put aside, bear in mind that propaganda is a useful way of humiliating Israel, but uh, let's not miscalculate about Israeli power. Not only that, but obviously the um, regional, not to say Arab, not to, to be too stereotypical about it, but the regional state of mind is conspiratorial. And uh, everyone remembers the lesson of May and then June 1967. There was a crisis of confidence in Israel. It started with some economic problems, a recession, and then the um, coalition fell apart and had to be reinforced by Moshe Dayan and Menachem Begin. And then Israel struck and won the Six-Day War. And politicians sometimes use such a crisis in order to lift themselves out of it by a military campaign. So a Nasrallah or a Yahya Sinwar in Gaza would suspect that given a pretext or a perceived threat, Netanyahu and his government could try to rally the troops and the population behind the campaign. So they would be quite careful not to give even a weakened Israel the sort of a chance to get out of its crisis by striking. Mm. One thing that I see from both sides now is uh, people, in order to make their case, try to undermine the other side and uh, maybe even to try to show how small they are, insignificant they are. If there's a letter with a thousand reservists, then the other side will say, oh, those names are fake or half of them don't serve. So in a way, Doron, I want to put you on the spot and ask you, how real is this threat to national security. And by the way, in a way, this is a sensitive question. I understand that. So you could deflect. But seriously, how serious is this with this scope of reservists saying, no, we're not going to serve anymore? It is serious. It is serious because uh, there are those who are saying that they're not going to serve, but there is a lot of others that are there is a turmoil of discussion among them, and where are we going, and what would happen after, if this uh, if this new uh, law would come into uh, to be to be effect uh, after, you know uh, Monday, or what would be the next stage? So 
It, there, there is a, it, it's, it is serious. We cannot look at it as something which is not serious. But yet, I think it's very important to say that if you ask all of those people, in, if for some reason we'd be in a situation that uh, there, is a, there is a war or there is a campaign or something like this, will you come to serve? The answer is yes. So, uh, so once again, I'm saying that they are holding their reserve but they are saying on the same on, on the same sentence that saying that if something would happen, we would be there. With an asterisk, if they <laughs> believe that the government is genuine in telling the people that Israel was attacked, that it was not a provocation by the government in order to use it for political purposes, yes, you are right. Everyone yeah. will show up. So, so conspiracies are, are, are in both sides. You, you just mentioned it before, and I want to refer to what you were saying because it, it is right. We are really, you know, from one hand, they could say maybe this is something that Israel is had in mind, but now they are more even more dangerous. They could also say in the other side that the best way to unite Israel is to go now to, to fight with us. So from one hand, I think that they are being even more determined. But then from the other, and they are sitting back and they're saying, look, what is happening? Um, let, you know, um, maybe it is a time for us to, to do something. And, uh, and uh, this is kind of a window for opportunity. And what is really, the, the real risk is miscalculation. If, if we would be in a situation that are miscalculating it, and then we'll fight ourselves in a war that both sides basically didn't want it, to happen now. Mm -hmm. This is my, my main concern. But obviously the Israeli together, government miscalculated six months ago <laughs> when it started uh, yeah. this agenda. Yeah. To, together, to, together of what is doing to, to Israel resilience and, and you know, we, we should look on, on our national level. And in the national level, it's not only the IDF. It's what is doing to our economy, uh, to investments that are coming in and out uh, from, from Israel or out Israeli money that is going out. I mean, it's much, much greater then the, the, the IDF, um, you know, what is happening within the IDF. Mm -hmm. I think it's obvious now that we are in consensus that the worst mistake our enemies can make now is to provoke something, not because of what they will, will happen to them, but because it will unite us in a way, in a way they will be solving all of our problems. Yeah. Dr. Lehman, I want to ask you, the issue that the reservists are raising now, the threat of the International Criminal Court, mm. um, their fear that maybe if from the outside. Compl complementarity it, collapses. It will be perceived from the outside that our judiciary system is not as robust and independent as it was in a way that will be more exposed internationally. Can you explain a bit the, yes, this fear? Uh, even even uh, a friend of Netanyahu, uh, such as uh, uh, Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz, uh, made this point that uh, Israel's legal system has been the defender of Israeli servicemen in the sense that uh, one of the uh, basic uh, uh, criteria, whether or not a case can be brought before the ICC, the International Criminal Court, of an, an individual Israeli who was supposed to have done this or that, uh, one of the criteria is whether or not there is a judicial system. Let's call the principle of complementarity. If it, there is a robust system, then the ICC will not deal with it because Israel, Israeli legal authorities deal with it. If there's a sense that they have been fatally weakened by government policy, then this could happen. And it's a cogent warning that, that, uh, that drives uh, the concern of, of, of the servicemen. I want to say something on, on the American side. But, but, but uh, excuse me, it also goes up the ladder to the political echelon. There is the so-called Yamashita doctrine regarding Japanese war criminals, even those commanders and cabinet officials who were only supposed to know what their subordinates did, even if the subordinates did not follow direct orders, even if they did not report it up the chain of command, they are responsible, accountable, and could face the same legal proceedings as the various sergeants and lieutenants. So if they do it, the government, Netanyahu and his cabinet ministers are as liable to face the uh, court uh, at Hague. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that is, of course, uh, very far down the road. The reasonableness clause is not necessarily the end of judicial uh, purview in Israel. But I would say something, uh, because we were focusing on the question of uh, whether or not our, our 
neighbors, some of our neighbors may miscalculate. I think the American government is actually sending also a very significant signal. On one hand, severe criticism of the Prime Minister Netanyahu on issues of, 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 on which they disagree with him. But at the same time, through the visit of President Herzog and through uh, the depth of inter military cooperation, the message is on security, we are with Israel. And internally, within Israel, we are with the defense establishment. We are with the deep state in Israel against this insurgency, as I described. When you say criticism by the United States, you, you don't mean necessarily criticism for the specific policy, but in the way which it is done unilaterally without consensus. consensus. Yes. Yeah, moving, is, moving to a major shift in constitutional balances without a broad consensus. Which is what probably most Israelis now believe should be done anyway, right? Because it's not uh, that, uh, that but, clear cut. But again, one should mention that ever since 1967, the Americans have always asked Israeli leaders, when you speak about Israel, what Israel do you mean? Israel in 1949-67 borders, the so-called Green Line, or Israel with the occupied territories? Because we, the United States, except perhaps for the Trump administration, we have another view of that. Doron, last 30 seconds are yours. <laughs> are you optimistic? What lays ahead? Well, it's hard to be optimistic. Uh... So it, it, I, I really, I can't say what would happen. Uh, but um, as I said, I, I see a, a strong tension between values here in Israel, and this is something that probably we will continue to deal with. We have, uh, you know, from coming from the military, we have to do an assessment every week to see where are we standing and what should be the, what should be done. So, a new generation of Israelis, <laughs> Israeli activists, has risen. It gives. Quite a lot of hope. That's all but, the time but you know that what? we have. I'm optimistic because I see the, the, the turmoil within within us. This is a real democracy. This is kicking that people are, are, are discussing values. This is very important. So with great optimism, thank you, Dr. Elan Lerman, not doctor. <laughs> Brigadier General Don Gavish, Mr. Amir Oren, and from vibrant democracy, young democracy Israel, still struggling to figure out what's going on here. Shalom from Jerusalem and see you next time.